Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to our series on thinking about the whole farm. And now we're going to uh, today or in this session, we're going to talk about learning systems. So let me just get all too keyed up here and get my slides uh, in a in a way that you can see them. And I think I've done that, so I'm just going to jump right in. So I'm here at a university, and we think about learning all the time. But one of the things that we don't think about a lot is, uh, or maybe we do, but I don't know how good a job we do, and that is sort of learning in the real world. Um, learning once we actually have some base knowledge. And that's what I want to emphasize or talk about today in this session. The themes that I'm going to touch on are um, adaptation. Uh, we adapt or maybe we don't carry on. Uh, talk a little bit about where our understanding, uh, our traditional knowledge comes from, ways of learning effectively, systems thinking, and then I have a section on ecological knowledge because the uh, we learn a lot about technology. You know, everybody is really familiar with their cell phones and they know how to handle it. Um, but what about uh, the ecosystem? And so talk about ecological knowledge and then a little bit on knowledge generation, because in our world, uh, farmers, organic farmers and organic practitioners play a really important role in generating knowledge. So let's get going. Where does our base knowledge come from? Well, we learn from our parents, our caregivers, our school, other family members, neighbors, friends. Um, and uh, maybe if we are lucky, we learn something about indigenous systems or indigenous ways of knowing. But you know, certainly speaking for myself and much of my generation, we think very much from a Western perspective. And that's, that's where sort of our foundation uh, has come from. And, and that's really good. I mean, I appreciate the knowledge I gained from uh, my caregivers and my family. Um, but I also recognize that we have to learn to adapt. Uh, in ecology, it's adapt or die, right? Um, and so uh, adapting requires that we learn new information and also that we experiment with that information. And this is the classic stages of adaptation process. Now, let me explain it to you. Um, it starts with conservation. Now, that's not soil conservation, although that's important too. It really speaks to a system that has worked well for us, and so we kind of stick with it. So if you have a hockey team and you have a certain way that you set up the defense and that works, uh, that's great. Why mess with success? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But what if you run into a team that just completely baffles your defense and they're scoring goals like crazy? At that point, you have to say, whoa, maybe we need to rethink uh, our defensive strategy and we need to release from it. So we go from conservation to release. We need to let go of that method that is not working as well as it used to. And probably the agricultural uh, example that is used most often at universities is herbicide resistant weeds. We've developed a system that uh, relies on chemical weed killers. And now we have you know, glyphosate re Roundup ready crops. And so that's buying us a little more time, but we know that we need to release, we need to organize a system so we're not so dependent on herbicides. And then we reorganize, uh, and that's where we capture new knowledge. And then we practice with that, whoops, we practice with that new knowledge, we exploit it and bring it back into our production system. So we go from uh, what, what always works to releasing it, this uh, box up here, reorganization is really where we're learning new information and then we're practicing with it and then putting it into our system. So those are the stages of adaptation. 
And we go through them all the time without even thinking about it. We're just, you know, we're, uh, this is not something brand new, but it is worth thinking about. Now that place where we reorganize or learn, uh, people who study learning, uh, like this person here, Robert Bork, um, and you can watch his videos uh, from Princeton University, he talks about we need effortful learning. Effort, effortful, not effortless learning, but effortful learning usually signals not only deeper learning, but more durable, long-lasting knowledge. It's analogous to weight training. Lifting heavier weights, which require more effort, will build more muscle in much the same way investing more effort in grappling with new information builds stronger, deeper knowledge. So what it's really telling us is that when we're learning, we need to be serious about it. We need to be more than superficial. Um, we need to um, actually try to understand it because it's it's like, you know, we're going to have to learn a little bit beyond our comfort zone. And all farms need a learning plan. This is me talking, not Professor Bork. Uh, a learning plan is something that's really important. I see a lot of farm families without a learning plan, um, where um, it's not part of the strategic plan of the farm, and that's a shame. So, um, I want to uh, give you a little bit of the, these, this text uh, to indicate what are the important features of a learning plan, according to Robert Bork. Okay. Um, the first one is allocate your attention efficiently. That means focus. When you're learning something, uh, you know, drill down and don't just learn it superficially. I have to say, I've been to a lot of field days and things, and, and somebody says something like, oh, well, you know, this system is just the best. Uh, uh, and so everybody nods, and, and, uh, but they haven't really thought critically about what, why that is, and uh, you need to think critically. Number two, you need to align your purposes to the goal. Be clear about what you want to learn. So if you want to learn about how green manures release their nitrogen and how you can manage that. You've got to understand that that's your goal. Number two, three, organize information that you're trying to learn. And that's where a teacher really helps. Number four, identify models and organizational patterns and other tools used by teachers. Um, so how does my teacher think about this topic? So if somebody's teaching you about soil health and they've taken a spade, put it in the soil, and then they've, they've dropped it in the soil the spade drop test and looked at its shatter and then they're explaining how the aggregates work and you can test a well aggregated soil versus a poorly aggregated soil. Um, try to mimic what they're doing and think like an expert. It helps you learn. Number five, uh, actively elaborate on what you're learning. That means try to put uh, the um, information that you're learning into your context, onto your farm, into your situation. Numbers, where we're at here. To make your knowledge more durable, vary your studying in terms of location, situations, et cetera. So uh, don't just sit in front of a computer and read. Get out in the field and, and you know, dig around the plants. Look for plant diseases if that's what you've been studying. Uh, you know, go, go into the manure pile and turn it over with a fork. Uh, see what it looks like. What does it smell like? Is it hot? Is it composting? And so don't just learn one way. And that's really when I think about what I said earlier, how universities struggle. Uh, we really understand that students can get a lot of knowledge. I mean, they just go to their cell phone and get about any kind of knowledge, but how we put it into context and how we experience it, we, can, we see that that's really important. So we're doing more field courses, getting students onto farms, getting students into real life situations. Uh, space your studying over time. You cannot cram. Uh, I think everybody kind of knows that. But um, this is the beauty of being involved in farming. Uh, and I've, I've heard it many times. People say, you know, 
that year I experienced this and and then this year I experienced this. That's an example of sort of spacing out your studying over time. Each year in annual crop production anyways, we get one chance. Um, and, you know, every time we have that experience, we learn something. But uh, they have this, this term, it's called interleave your studying to enhance your memory of it. Uh, cramming doesn't work. Uh, learn something for a while and then go do something else and then go back to it. You're going to learn it better. And then draw a representation of what you're learning. And in the um, uh, <clears throat> planning process uh, and stock taking module of this session, I introduced mind maps and mind maps of key concepts are really important. So this is some of the theory of learning. And, uh, and I think one of the, the really positive things about all these examples is that a lot of farmers do this really well. Okay, so speaking of farmers doing this well, I want to give an example of, of, of exactly what I talked about. So I went to a field day yesterday, um, and it was um, uh, about 300 kilometers from where I live and at uh, Boulanger Organic Farms. And Mark Boulanger talked about um, uh, uh, a field of organic winter wheat, which he had seeded into rolled sweet clover is a beautiful crop. And so what were the things, there's Mark there, and what were the things that allowed Mark to give an effective, um, um, you know, educational experience for those people who visited? Number one, he had some base knowledge. Um, he has some education in agriculture and, uh, um, and so that was that was really good. Um, he uh, has uh, experienced what's called desirable difficulties. Now, I haven't talked about that yet, but you want to challenge yourself. And that's what Dr. Bork, who's in the upper left there, calls desirable difficulties. So what Mark did is he grew sweet clover. It grew massively tall, and he didn't know what to do with it. And so he got a hold of a crimper roller and he rolled it. And uh, he had never done that before. And so, you know, that's really challenge challenging himself. And that's what um, the learning theory people say is important to learn new things is create a, you know, challenge yourself. Um, and then he seeded winter wheat into it uh, with a no-till disc drill, had a beautiful crop or has a beautiful crop coming. And... I also put spacing for reflection because, of course, none of not all of this happens in one day, right? The seeding of the sweet clover happens, and then months later, you roll it, and then you seed the crop, and then a year later, you look at the crop and see what it looks like. And the other thing that Mark did is he had the courage to host a field day at the field uh, where he became the teacher. And I love this not only because it's super fun to listen to people with deep experience in their farming system talk about their work because they're so enthusiastic and they're extremely knowledgeable, but it makes him a better learner. And that's another thing that is well documented is when you try to explain your system to another person, you learn it at a deeper level. So people talking at the coffee shop about their system, that's great. Keep drinking coffee. Um, it helps you learn. And sometimes we say something, we go, oh, I actually didn't. If we have the courage to admit that we don't know everything, we go, oh, I, I had thought, thought about that part of it. I better do some more research. And so I have to tell you, Mark was so creative. He had a television out there and a computer and a generator running it. And he showed us videos of when he was crimper rolling the, the sweet clover. It was, it was an amazing experience for me. I loved it. But it demonstrated really important ways of learning. Now, we need a goal. We need a plan. So what are our learning goals in organic agriculture? You know, and maybe you can sit and make a list of things that you'd really like to learn. Let me give you um, a list that um, people who've studied organic agriculture have come up with. Um, they have presented this four-step process to becoming more sustainable in agriculture. 
Step one or level one is increasing the efficiency of conventional practices. And so, you know, for our fertilizers, which we hear about all the time, that's where, that's where that fits in. Level two is substituting conventional practices with alternative practices. So maybe instead of using a herbicide to kill weeds, you uh, crimp roll some sweet clover and you suppress those weeds with the mulch, okay? That's, that's something that we would do in organic agriculture. And level three is what uh, people like uh, Stephen Gleesman and Iveta Perfecto say we need to focus on. We need to redesign the system so that it functions on the basis of, eco of ecology. And that's where agroecology comes from. And, and so really, if we're, if we're going up the sustainability elevator, we say, what, what floor do you want to go on? What level do you want to go on? We say, we don't want level one. We don't want level. We want to go to level three. And so uh, we need our learning has to be about a practical ecology that we can use on the farm. Now, remember I said, where does our knowledge come from? It comes from, you know, our family and, and much of the agricultural knowledge that we have really comes from Northern Europe. And this slide here shows the evolution of agricultural production in Northern Europe. Back in 1500, we had a two crop rotation, fallow crop, fallow crop. And then people developed a three crop rotation. And this took over a hundred years because it meant land tenure had to change. So now we had fallow and then maybe uh, a, um, and then maybe a, a crop of, of beans and then a crop of wheat or a crop of beans and then a crop of barley. And in the early 1800s, um, in England, they developed the four course, the Norfolk four course rotation. This introduced fodder crops into the rotation. So livestock wasn't just fed on the common lands, but livestock were integrated into the farming system. This was a game changer. This allowed, allowed the population of Europe to go up quite a bit because it became much more productive. And then by the late 1800s, uh, um, there were a lot of seven-year crop rotations in Northern Europe, and my family farmed in, in Northern Germany for 200 years. And this is the rotation that is in the family uh, archives from about uh, 1890 to, uh, to the late 1940s. Um, and, um, and this uh, involves uh, winter crops, um, potatoes, turnips, and livestock are integrated into there. And then along comes fertilizer, and basically uh, people abandon their crop rotations. And so what I um, um, observe is that right now a lot of European agriculture is at level two. They're trying to, you know, or level one, they're trying to be efficient in their inputs. Uh, they were at level three. They were at a farming system where they were embracing ecology, but that was abandoned because of of the inputs that were became available. And so, um, you know where I'm going with this, we need to think about these historical systems. We need to add technology to them for sure, for sure. Uh, but we need to think about what was the ecological uh, merit of those, you know, seven year crop rotations. And to get there, we need to think about systems because a wheat canola rotation, which is what is practiced in Northern Europe right now, winter canola, winter wheat, uh, that's the predominant land use on the lands that my, where my father grew up and my mother grew up. Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, that is, that is a very um, formulaic farming system. But if we're going to employ ecology, we're going to do systems thinking. Can we do this? Absolutely, we've done it before. And when I think about how we shifted from basically monoculture to systems thinking, I am uh, thinking about the no-till revolution. So what I'm showing you here is the production guides that were produced by the Manitoba North Dakota Zero Tillage Farmers Association over whatever, uh, 20, 20 years. Uh, in 1991, uh, the production manual was all about how to deal with residue and how to 
make you know monoculture no-till work, how to apply your fertilizer. Uh, six years later, the production guide was, uh, they've got a duck nest in there, they've got mulches, and um, 20 years after uh, the organization produced its first production manual, uh, they produced this um, the zero tillage evolution. There's an earthworm, there's an animal, there's some soil. This reads like an agroecology textbook. So congratulations to those people who did that. And that came about because of a lot of adaptation, a lot of adaptive learning. And now uh, um, not everybody who practices zero tillage has gone over to no, to organic. I mean, it's a, it's a small community, but organic agriculture is a manifestation of a lot of adaptation uh, built on these ecological principles. So we have been able to put systems together and uh, so we, we can do this. And just to show you the pictures of the success that we've had, I mean, back 120 years ago, here's a picture of steam plowing in Manitoba. Um, you know, that's what John Gardner called the mechanical era of agriculture. And then we adopted no-till and we went to the chemical era of agriculture and that allowed us to conserve water. And so, um, and then uh, now uh, we are in the biological era of agriculture. And that's really uh, what we need to be thinking about um, with uh, our systems uh, design uh, that we need to learn. And yesterday when we looked at Marc Boulanger's uh, sweet clover mulch that he had crimp rolled, he had all the water conserving benefits from no-till, but he did that by using a plant uh, that fixed its own nitrogen and did not need any herbicide to die. And so um, the crimp roller, is, just as an example, is something that we have adapted in the prairies now. I think the first time I ever heard of a crimp roller was in the context of using it to crimp roll rye and then to seed organic soybeans. Well, that's great if you're in, you know, um, a, a, a longer season, warmer climate, and even you could use um, a crimp roller to crimp roll hairy vetch and then seed to organic corn. And if you look on the bottom left, you can see another farm family, Upland Organics. They've adapted the roller also to, to roll uh, sweet clover. So this is an example of how farmers have used adaptive learning to even learn how to adapt the, the crimper roller. Okay, we're talking about learning systems. And so sorry, folks, but I'm going to throw a little more theory at you. Um, I apologize in advance, but hopefully it's helpful. So uh, the Weinberg model, to me, makes a lot of practical sense. Okay, so what you have on the x-axis here is complexity. So this could be monoculture. This is a complex cropping system. And on the left-hand y-axis, we have randomness. And what Weinberg did is broke this into three zones. The first zone he called organized simplicity. These are, these are things like machines or very simple technologies. So these are uh, not particularly complex and they're pretty predictable. They're, they're low in their randomness. An example of this is a seeder. Even though an air seeder is this amazing machine with all these hoses and and, and precision planting and depth control and variable rate controllers. In the, in, the, in the context of the farming system, its role is pretty simple. It puts seed in the ground. The second zone is what uh, Weinberg calls unorganized complexity. These are things that are highly random, very difficult to predict. And examples of that are weather, commodity prices, and evolution things that just happen on their own, like herbs, weeds developing herbicide resistance. And then the third zone is what he refers to as organized complexity or the zone of systems. And this is where farmers live. They use the machine, they, they design systems that are subject to the organized, uh, the unorganized complexity of weather, 
commodity prices, trade wars, and they use the tools out of the toolbox to make that system work. I don't know if this theory helps you. If it doesn't, wipe it from your memory banks. Um, but it helps me understand that farmers work with systems that aren't highly predictable. The cedar is predictable. We can set the combine. It's pretty predictable. We can reduce combine losses through all kinds of new technologies. But in terms of the farming system, putting that whole thing together makes farming designers. And, that, and that's why at universities and other colleges, we've started taking, well, we've always done this, but we're intensifying uh, inviting farmers as the teachers because they are, con they are system designers and they um, use all their knowledge of all those things in their mind map. And so they're really helpful to let students see the big picture. So if you got that, um, let me tell you this story. I, uh, this is the atrium of our uh, teaching building. And what I did is I put tape on the floor and I had the students in the cropping system class cut articles out of uh, farm newspapers. And I, they didn't cut out the ads, just articles. And then I made them put the articles into zone one, two, or three. And what was interesting is most of the articles were about simple machines. There were a lot of articles about markets. And this is the area where there were the fewest articles. Uh, that is uh, articles that talked about whole systems. And this is why it's so important that organic farmers, you know, learn from other farmers who also work in systems, farmer to farmer peer learning. And, um, and this is where, you know, it's important to draw a mind map. And I talked about mind maps last session. Anyways, um, uh, in organic farming uh, and in all farming, we really need to fo focus on systems thinking. So an example would be, how do we get nutrients into organic lands? How do we control weeds? How do we maintain health? Even if farmers till soil, how do we do crop livestock integration? These are things that uh, require a systems approach. An example, let's say we have wild oats. Um, one thing I would encourage you to do is if you have a weed, draw a mind map around that weed. And that will tell you something about how much you are putting that problem into a systems context. So I did this. What did I put in here? Clean weed-free seed. Oh yeah, that's good. Chaff collection, sure, that helps. Uh, fall cereals, right? That reduces wild oats, but fall cereals, you can grow winter wheat. You can grow fall rye, but fall rye might not have the best market. It could have more ergot. Um, the, uh, if we have fall cereals, we could have a problem by increasing Canada thistle if we're avoiding fall tillage. And so we could patch treat the wild oats. Um, we could hay the, the wild oat patches. Um, so this is my attempt at encouraging you to take a look at a problem, but then put it into a system. Hopefully that works. Another challenge I think is really, really timely, and that's to have farmers draw mind maps around the management of Canada thistle. Canada thistle is a major problem in organic production. And um, so just for, for, for interest, what I do with the students is I get them to draw a mind map of controlling Canada thistle and compare that with the control of dandelion. Dandelion has a single tap root. Canada thistle has these incredible root systems, which can, uh, which can go very deep. They can put lateral roots out. They can produce new shoots from very deep in the soil. It's a very different animal. Um, and so the, to control Canada thistle, you need a systems approach. Controlling dandelion by comparison is quite simple. Okay, so if we're going to um, do the systems design in organic agriculture and we've got challenges like wild oats and Canada thistle and nutrients, uh, where is what is the knowledge that we're drawing on? Um, can we go to the you know local crop input supply dealer and get some help? 
well, I mean, they can give us some good seed and they, they might have some really good advice on seeding systems or maybe forecasting what fusarium is going to be like. But in organic agriculture, we also need ecological knowledge. And if we think about that seven-year crop rotation uh, that my family has produced these wonderful records on, I've learned so much from them. This, by the way, is in German. Uh, you know, there's a, what is the ecological knowledge that was required to sustain those? And examples of ecological knowledge for organic farming are something as simple as nitrogen fixation, intercropping grain crops, crop rotation to control Canada thistle. We can apply ecological knowledge to those things. So what I've done in the notes, and I'm going to elaborate on it here, is I'm going to go through and define different ecological terms, okay? So a population, it's a group of the same species growing together. So I've got a population of faba bean plants. A community is defined as all of the populations that live in the same place at the same time. So here we've got a faba bean oat community. Abundance is the not total number of individuals of a species that live in a specific area. This could, for example, be how many Canada thistle shoots per square meter, or how many cattle on an 80-acre field. Species richness is the number of species in a given area. So here we see sunflowers, millet. Um, the more species you have, the greater the richness of the species. An ecosystem is all the living and non-living components that interact within an area at once. So think of a farm or even a field as an ecosystem. Use a mind map to show the parts and the connections within that farm ecosystem. Biodiversity, we hear a lot about this, is the variation of species in that ecosystem. How many plant species are growing in a pasture? How many uh, different animal species and plant species are part of their pasture? And I, I hit the pause button here on the definitions to show you this, this figure. Um, and here we have, again, this Weinberg model. And what ecological theory tells us from people like Elton and others is that to increase the stability of the system, you need more diversity. So complexity and diversity is kind of the same thing. So in order to reduce the randomness of your cropping system, which lives here, you need to have complexity, which means biodiversity. Your ecosystem has to have diversity. So that red line is really important. If you want to red line it, I remember when you were younger, right? You wanted to red line the car. I never had a red line on my car. I don't even think I had a tachometer, but anyways, um, you need that diversity. This is called the diversity stability hypothesis. Okay, let's keep going. And when you have that diversity, you also get ecosystem services. Like for example, uh, this is the wildlife habitat index for the prairies and the Peace River region. You can see where I'm here right now in, in the Red River Valley, there is not a lot of habitat for wildlife in the agriculture that we practice. And that's, that's a problem. And that means that we don't have enough biodiversity. Um, you know, farmers are going to start getting paid for this, I'm sure. Okay, let's carry on. I know it's kind of boring, but definitions are useful. Biotic factors basically means living things, plants and animals, like plants, or like the leaf diseases here in this wheat. That's a biotic factor. Mycorrhiza are fungi, which associate with plant roots. I think many people know about mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, they're a living factor. Abiotic factors are non-living things like wind and water and light and the non-living part of soil. So abiotic stress is something like wind erosion. Carrying capacity is the maximum capacity of an area which can sustain a certain population size. We often think about how many animals per acre in a grazing system. A climax community is a biological community that through the process of succession has reached a steady state. So a native pasture with bison is often at a climax level. 
And then there's competition. Competition is a, a mutually detrimental interaction between species which share limited resources. So here we were trying to intercrop flax with wheat, but we set the flax seeding rate too high by accident, so the flax overpowered the wheat. There's different types of competition. Interspecific competition is between individuals of different species. For example, uh, wild mustard with this cereal crop below ground, this very famous diagram from Saskatchewan showing how that wild mustard is competing. Or intraspecific competition is when you have competition within the same species, like this oat crop, if you go at a higher and higher, higher seeding rate, you might actually have a less productive stand in the end because there's too much competition. Then there's all these other much more complicated ecological terms. Mutualism is when two species somehow benefit each other. So here you have um, um, water fern growing in, um, in a pond that's, that they're going to transplant rice into. It feeds the ducks. Uh, but the ducks also look after the weeds and the ducks uh, produce phosphorus for the rice. So it's more than two species. Facilitation is where one species benefits from the presence of another. So uh, the, the chickpea benefits from the flax that it's intercropped with because there's less ascochyta. Or the flax organic flax crop benefits from a strip of pea around the edge because it traps or deters the grasshopper from going into the flax. That's called facilitation. Then we've got symbiosis, which is an interaction between two different biological organisms. And one of the most popular examples is nodules fixing nitrogen in a legume plant. So I know a lot of these things are practical terms that you know about, but I think it is useful to know uh, the ecological term because it, it helps you then maybe read further. So let's keep going. We're almost done. A food web is an interlocking pattern formed by a series of interconnecting food webs. Decomposers break down decaying or dead or get organisms. And I remember somebody saying, that you know, the study of organic agriculture, half of it is really studying decomposition because you're always growing legumes and then wanting to decompose that legume to supply nitrogen to the next crop. And it's the bacteria that are helping break down the legume into nitrogen, which the corn can use and allowing the plant to break down straw, the soil to break down straw. A generalist species is one that can make use of a variety of resources. And unfortunately, a grasshopper, or at least the three or four species that are detrimental to crops, are generalist species. Then we have this term niche. A niche is the role that an organism plays in an ecosystem, including both the environmental condition it needs and its interaction with other organisms. So here we have a picture from the, oh, I'm so sorry, from the Glenley rotation. And you'll notice that this organic flax crop has wild mustard growing here, but not as much in the back. That's because the back part of this plot never receives any composted manure. The front half does. The wild mustard being a non-mycorrhizal weed needs more phosphorus to grow. The flax has mycorrhiza, it does just fine in low phosphorus soil. So the niche for the wild mustard is soil that has a slightly higher soil phosphorus level. And the same is true for red root pigweed. These plants are both non-mycorrhizal. And then we have succession. Um, we have uh, is the directional change in the structure of a community over time. So if you have a field of, um, of uh, let's say, a, a, a crop field and you stop farming it, it grows annual weeds and then perennial weeds and then maybe some willows and then maybe all the way to trees. That's called succession. And primary succession is that first step. And one of the first steps in primary succession in agriculture is to grow the weeds like mustard, 
redroot lamb's quarters, green foxtail, uh, that are the first weeds to, to usually to germinate after something like tillage. They're called the R selection weeds for what it's worth. And the final definition, we're almost done, is disturbance. And one of the reasons I left this till last is because I want to emphasize that disturbance can be physical, but it also can be chemical and it can be caused by grazing. Tillage is not the only form of disturbance. Using a herbicide and wiping out a third of the plants that are weeds is also disturbance. Now, almost done, hang in there, put it on pause and come back, go get yourself a cup of coffee. Um, how do we develop this ecological knowledge? Well, there's, there's two main ways that humans have developed ecological knowledge. One is the not desirable way. It's called the depletion crisis model, which means when we like ran out of food and we started having to whatever, eat each other. Um, you know, a depleted fishery or Easter islands where people basically abandon the place. What we really want to emphasize is the ecological understanding model, where ecological terms are discussed and we, um, we actually uh, understand examples. Like I've got some examples listed here, but one of the most interesting examples for me that I learned only a few years ago is that indigenous populations were hunting beavers in the boreal forest when the, you know, the, the fur companies wanted the, the trade, but they did not hunt the beavers on the dryland prairie. Why? Because the beavers were damming the water and giving a secure water supply, not only for the humans, but also for the bison to come and drink so the bison could be hunted. That's sophisticated ecological knowledge. And that's really what I'm trying to emphasize here to organic farmers is to, is to really uh, you know, amp up your ecological knowledge uh, because it can become very, very practical and don't learn it through disasters. Last slide, I think. Um, one of the features of agriculture and especially organic agriculture is farmers are always learning from each other and they are contributing to knowledge. And so we like to to talk about the term knowledge generation comes from various expert groups, scientists, university people, extension people, industry people, but also farmers. And so the systems that we design for successful organic farmings are co-designed by a whole group of experts. And the places to come together and to you know, gain that peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, are, are many, and I think uh, I would encourage all farmers to uh, check out these resources because they're very, very important for understanding the, uh, uh, for, for creating that knowledge base that's required. So that is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for your patience. Um, I wish you uh, a great rest of the day or evening, whatever time you're watching this and take good care. Bye-bye.